لا حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه كما يحب ربنا سبحانه وتعالى ويرضاه وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده رسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Yesterday morning we read Hadith 465 in which the author رحمه الله تعالى said وصح التلميذي أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم لعن الجالسة وسط الحلقة Imam Tirmidhi has a hadith in his jami' which he said was Hassan Sahih that the Prophet والسلام, cursed a man Jalasa Wasat al Halqa, a man who sits in the middle of the circle. A man who sits in the middle of the circle. Al Dhahabi Rahimullah Ta'ala he said, Ma Yuhtamal, he says that which is possibly from the major sins and that which possibly isn't from the major sins. As we explained before, when the word la'ana is mentioned, then it's automatically something that's haram, and it's automatically something from the major sins. So there are many ahadith that the author mentioned in which there's no severe wa'id, and he put them in his book. And he put many ahadith in the uh, appendix or in the, the supplement in which la'ana is clearly mentioned or other things, and he says yuhtama, possibly and possibly not. So that's something to understand when you read in a book. Khairan, inshallah. Um, as far as this hadith, then ulama of Islam, they differ over its authenticity. Um, and those who say that it is authentic, they say it means as if a person sits in the middle of the halqa, giving him some status or position that he doesn't deserve. Whether it be showing off or imitating some type of virtue that Allah has not given him. Like I'm leading this halqa. It may be 100 people, 300 people, a huge circle of people. And I'm sitting there as an imposter. I remind you, this is one interpretation of the hadith and others as well. Hadith 466, the author says, mm-hmm. He says here, uh, Hadith 466, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, hasad." He says, beware of envying people. Beware of being jealous. Beware of jealousy and envy. Because jealousy and envy destroys one's good deeds. Like fire consumes wood. Like fire consumes wood. And this hadith is collected by Imam Abu Dawood. This hadith clearly shows us the danger and the harm of jealousy and envy. Some of the ulama of Islam, they say the wisdom behind this wording saying, is that wood doesn't just melt in the fire. Rather, the wood is totally destroyed, crushed and crumbled in the fire. You set it at a campfire and the wood is crackling or a fireplace in your home and it's what? It's crackling. And a big solid log that you couldn't normally break, you would injure yourself trying to break if it fell on your foot, eventually, slowly, over time, becomes like nothing, turns into ash. And the fire, because of its heat and its intensity, decomposes and breaks down, combusts huh? the wood. So they say this is what the hasad does to the person's heart. It totally consumes their heart, in which they don't realize what they say, they don't realize what they do, quote unquote, they look in the mirror, huh? and they see the person that they envy, the person that they're jealous. And they begin to forget about themselves, and they begin to lose out on reason and logic. That's why you see people that are unfortunately full of hasad, full of envy and jealousy, they say things that are totally irrational. You're not even making any sense anymore. What are you saying? Because the hasad is what? You're just engulfing them. Are you understanding this? And the ulama of Islam, they also say that this hadith, from its wisdoms, is that the concept of a fire that continues to burn and rage, and that the one who has hasad never gets a break. He never feels good about himself. He, he never looks at Allah's blessings. He never reflects and he never ponders upon what he has the opportunity to do and to achieve. And that Allah is the one who gave this one that and gave that one that. Allah is the one who decreed these things and ordained these things. So as if you're being angry with Allah. As if you're displeased with Allah's qadr. The fire doesn't give him a what? It doesn't give him a break. It destroys. It ruins. It wrecks his heart and his mind. So they say this is the concept of the fire and the firewood, and it's the concept of hasad. Only Allah knows uh, how many of us are afflicted by this problem on a daily basis. We see something that we don't have. We don't say, mashallah, 
La quwwata illa billah. Alhamdulillah, Allah gave that to Fulan. I'm happy for him. I wish I had money like him too, but I'm not angry at him. I don't wish that his money goes away and becomes ruined and becomes destroyed. Or a sister sees another sister who's just naturally more beautiful than her. She's born better than her. MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah, may Allah bless you in your marriage. I'll pray for you. That's it. And not necessarily, oh, and this, and she's kada, and she's this, and, and it's ugly. Many people are afflicted by this. As far as da'wah, as far as ilm, I don't think we need to talk about that. What Hasid has done to yani, Islam, to the call to Islam, the call to the Sunnah, the call to the proper way, only Allah knows huh? how many people yani, were warned against, became deviants because of Hasid. Pure envy. That you're naturally more talented than me. That you're naturally more blessed than I am. That you're more skilled than me. That you studied longer than I did. You speak better than me. You're younger than me. Only Allah knows, yani. And then the, the strange thing about it is, as we just said, how it just consumes your brain and your common sense. People, they'll reject a thousand different virtues of the person that they're talking about and they'll look for one small thing. And they'll say, you can't listen to this person because of this. And totally ignore a mountain, not a, a mountain of good deeds, of benefit, and of service to the Muslims. And that's because of no reason except for hasad. It doesn't matter how... Uh, how long you hold it or how hot. If it's hot, it's going to burn you. Everybody understand this? They say like a hot plate. It's hot. It's going to burn your fingertips. Your nerves instantly send a message to your brain to drop the thing. So that's all you need is a touch of fire to feel the pain. And the same applies to an issue, a problem, because the hasad has enraged, huh? totally taken over their hearts. And then the strange thing about it, someone says, well, I'm not jealous. I'm not jealous. I'm not, I'm not jealous against the brother. Why would I be jealous? The moment you have to talk like that and speak like that proves that what? You wouldn't even have to defend yourself like that if that wasn't the case. Because it's a clear reason. So may Allah protect us from this disease and from this illness. Allah mentioned this about the Yehud. This is one of their cancers, is that they had jealousy, they had envy. Everybody understand this? And as we said, this is even applicable to this day. If you, you walk down the street in New York City, you go to Brooklyn, huh? you see a Hasidic Jew or Orthodox Jew, supposedly, whatever, that's, whatever that means, uh, and they see you with a beard and a thobe. They give you an eye. They look at you in a certain way. Why are you dressed like this? You're supposed to be a worthless, useless Gentile. You're not supposed to have a sharia. We have sharia. You're supposed to be like the average Christian that has no knowledge, no fiqh. Jesus, Sunday, hallelujah, that's it. Eat pork, and that's it. But they see you with your trimmed mustache, full beard, thobe above the ankles, like, whoa. We are supposed to be the only ones who have this type of detailed knowledge and adhere to our religion. And it's hasad, it's jealousy. And many of them know what the Quran says about them. And they know what they did and they know what they do. So Allah says, Am yahsuduna nasa. He says, or do they envy people Allah, based off of what Allah gave them, what Allah blessed them with. And then he talks about Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam and what Allah gave him of bounty. So the Prophet Sallallahu tells us that we will imitate the Jews, we will imitate the Christians, we will follow their ways. And from the things which we imitate and follow their ways is hasad. Hasid will destroy a masjid, it will destroy, it destroy a community, it may destroy a marriage. Okay? And the permissible thing in Islam is that which is called al ghibta As the Prophet ﷺ said, لا حسد إلا فثنتين. He says there should be no hasad except for one or two types of people. The first is a man who's wealthy. Allah gives him wealth, blesses him with wealth. And the man spends his money on the cause of Allah. فَصَلَّتَهُ عَلَى هَلَكَتِهِ فِي الْحَقِّ he doesn't care. He just spins, spins, spins. He's rich and extremely generous to the point as if he's just reckless with his money. You want it, you got it. That's it. That's a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And secondly, he says, A man atahu Allahu hikmatan. Allah gives him wisdom. Okay, alayhi salatu wasalam. He says, a man who has wisdom, meaning knowledge meaning intellectual power and strength. And he spends his night and his day teaching it and helping the people out. And there's another narration as well with regards to the Qur'an. Al-Muhim, is the of Islam, they say what's meant by this is ghibta. It's for you to wish that you had what he had, but not to wish that it's taken and stripped away from the first person. If you wish like that, then it's hasad. And it's blameworthy. As far as if you say, I'm jealous that they put together such a scholarly book, 
I'm jealous that the brothers are so young and they got a chance to study the Quran. Meaning, I'm happy for them and I wish I could do it too. Everybody understand this? Khayran, inshallah. Moving forward. The next narration, 467, the author says, ماذا عليه لكان أن يقف أربعين خيرا له وقال صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا صلى أحدكم إلى ما يستره من الناس فأراد أحد أن يجتاز بين يديه فليدفع فليدفعه في نحره فإن أبا فليقاتله فإنما هو الشيطان وفي اللفظ لمسلم فإن أبا فليقاتل فإنما هو القرين حديث 467 The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said Someone who wishes to walk in front of another while they're offering a salah If they knew if they had any idea of the seriousness, the graveness of this act, it would be better for them to wait and stand for 40. It would be better for them to wait and to stand for 40. The narrations say, I don't know whether the Prophet said 40 days, 40 months, 40 years. He said, 40. Uh, 468, the Prophet also said, whenever you offer the salah and you have a sutra in front of you, something to block you, to screen you, and someone wishes to come and interfere between you and your sutra, then you should stop him. You should prevent him physically. And if he persists, if this person or this thing refuses, then you should use strength and harshness in keeping them away from walking in front of you. Another wording says, Because he has a demon with him. There's a demon accompanying this person or this individual that refuses except to walk in front of you between yourself and between the sutra. These hadiths prove following things. Number one, that praying towards the sutra is mandatory and not recommended. That praying towards the sutra is a fault, it's wajib. And the view that says that you have to pray, that you, it's optional, is not a strong view in light of the authentic hadith. That which is strong is that you must pray towards a sutra. Number two, is that you're not allowed someone to walk between you and your sutra. And you are to physically stop, prevent, and force them. The literal translation says, فَلْيُقَاتِلْهُ Fight him. That's the literal translation. Fight him. Put up a fight. Huh? Strike him. Naam? For him to stop from walking between you and between your sutra. The third ruling shows us is that if you don't have a sutra, then you don't have the sacredness and inviolable nature of someone walking in front of you. Where he clearly says, yes, turu, that which screens him from the people. So if you don't take a sutra, then you don't necessarily have this right. Everybody understand this? You don't necessarily have this right. You, you don't implement the sunnah, you lose out what? On certain things. These hadiths also show us the danger of walking between a Muslim and his sutra. And that is a major sin. Khayrin, inshallah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Narration 470. وَالَّذِي نَفْسِ بِيَدِهِ لَا يَتَدْخُلُنَّ الْجَنَّةَ حَتَّى تُؤْمِنُوا وَلَا تُؤْمِنُوا حَتَّى تَحَابُوا أو لا أَدُلُّكُمْ عَلَى شَيْءٍ إِذَا فَعَلْتُمُوهُ تَحَابَبْتُمْ أَفْشُ السَّلَامَ بَيْنَكُمْ Narrated Abu Hurairah رضي الله عنه, the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم says, I swear by Allah, the one whose hand my soul is, you shall not enter paradise until you believe. You should not enter paradise until you have iman. And you should not have iman until you love one another. Let me tell you something. A quick, easy, simple way of loving each other, he says, is to spread the salams to one another. It's to spread the salams to one another. This hadith shows us, unfortunately, the sad status of many of us, most of us today, uh, Muslims. We see another Muslim, we walk past another Muslim, we walk into a masjid, into a home, and we don't give the salams. Whether we say hi, whether we say hello, whether we say yo, what's up, or whether we say hayakallah, Ha, huh? marhaba, instead of assalamu alaikum, okay? Whether you see a Muslim, but the Muslim is from a different sect in Islam, denomination, it is not with your upon, or the Muslim is from a different race, or the Muslim is a different age, younger than you, older than you, or whatever the case may be, or you're scared to be recognized as a Muslim, or you're yourself involved in sin and evil, whatever the case may be. One reason or another, the shaitan oftentimes prevents us from giving the salams to each other. And that's sad. You mean there's some people, you may walk into a masjid, you give them salams, and they just look at you. 
Or some people say, assalamu alaikum, nigga. Like, yes, brother. Are you not hear me say, assalamu alaikum? That's my haq upon you. It's not an option. If I give you salams individually, not as a group, collectively, it's mandatory for you to return the salams back to me. Let alone, we not even get into the concept of loving each other. Assalamu alaikum. Huh? Assalamu alaikum. I shake his hand. I speak to him. I smile in his face. That automatically is going to instill some type of love. That automatically is going to break some type of tension. That automatically, Bidna Naitala, is going to remove some type of negativity just by me speaking to him, let alone saying, may salam be with you, be upon you. May you be safe. May you be... That's, that's a major concept, major greeting. And it's no accident why this is one of the most well-known practices of the Muslims to the non-Muslims. They may not know this ruling, that ruling, this injunction, but they know Muslims say, Salaam Alaikum. Everybody understand this? It's not an accident behind that because it's such a powerful meaning and message. May peace be with you. I come in safety. I'm not going to harm you. You come into my house, you're not going to be harmed. Everybody understand this? So the Prophet, he says, give the salams to each other. So the shaitan, he allows us to come with a thousand excuses not to spread the salams. And the salams, without a doubt, is a manifestation of healthy Islam. That Islam is strong and it's thriving. Everybody understand this? Only Allah knows what the kuffar, how they react when they hear assalamu alaikum. Those that like it, it sounds nice. Those that are afraid and terrified. Oh, Muslims coming, assalamu alaikum. Everybody understand this? And just listen to how it sounds. Assalamu alaikum. It has a feeling to it, no doubt. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, everybody understand this? It's the energy that you get from that statement. Assalamu alaikum. It sounds deep. It's not an average normal statement. And do you realize that Allah's name is As-Salam? Everybody understand this? Let me go on and on and on with regards to the benefits of the Salam, uh, the etiquettes of the Salam, and the rulings of the Salam. What's important is, is that this is one of the most abandoned practices of the deen today, of the Muslims. In the airport, in a restaurant, downtown Brooklyn, wherever you go, Yemeni Cafe, you walk into the place, you say, as alaikum. If that. Some people, they may scorn you, look down upon you, look at you funny for saying assalamu alaikum. And that's unfortunate. But everybody, yet and still, they say, we want to go to Jannah. We want to go to paradise. Everybody says, we are believers. The author, he then says, Akhir al-kitab, walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salawatuhu, ala sayyidina muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Nakaltu min thani nuskhatin kuriat ala al-musannif. وعليها خطه قال صح ذلك وكتبه مؤلفه محمد بن أحمد الشافعي and this here ولله الحمد is the end of the book in which it says all praises for Allah the Lord of all the worlds may prayers and salutations be sent upon Muhammad our leader our master all of his family members and all of his companions we ask Allah عز وجل to reward the author immensely we ask Allah عز وجل to allow us to take uh, benefit to reap fruit from all of the beneficial narrations, the hadith, explanations, all the things that we've read, walillahi alhamd, uh, and we ask Allah to forgive the author. Uh, well, uh, nothing more to say. Rinnanay ta'ala. Jazakumullah khayran for all of the brothers and sisters who sat in the classes, uh, who listened to the classes online. Rinnanay ta'ala. May Allah bless you all. Assalamu alaikum.